run over communities and reintroduce geothermal. And if they had just said, we're going to do it sanely, we're going to talk to the community, everything would have been fine. But this sort of, when the governor comes out and says, there are six-minute Hawaiians, the Hawaiians have just popped out of the woodwork and are now protesting, it has created a firestorm against geothermal. Now, geothermal does not exist just in Puna. It also exists on the west side of the Big Island. Hualalai, above Kailua Kona, has geothermal resources. So if the west side of the island needs more energy, and the geothermal is there, why not use that section to explore for the geothermal instead of going into Puna, into the native Hawaiian communities, and trying to run roughshod over that community. Interesting. So geothermal has its place, but it should not be done in a disrespectful way. I actually like the idea of geothermal um, at the same time, though. In the places that geothermal has been set up, to today's standards, the environment normally pays a price. Um, yes, the gases can be pumped back to the land. However, those gases do come back up and poison the land that's around it. The other problem with geothermal that is in current technology is the methods by which they drill and the types of petroleum products they use to maintain those drills while they are making those wells. In the future, maybe geothermal will be cool. But with the current technologies, I would really have to take a second look at Chris raises a good point, and I should have addressed it in my original talk. Every environmental, every energy product that we use worldwide, every one has cultural impacts, everyone has environmental impacts. You can't escape it. For example, wind systems require very powerful magnets. The magnets use trace minerals. The minerals are dug up in places like China, which has enormous resources. And probably people here can guess the other country with enormous resources. It accounts for why we invaded them. Afghanistan. So you have to pull up these trace minerals from the ground, pour acid over them. In China, they just pour acid in the public and leave the acid lakes all over the place because they don't have environmental laws. Then we get the wind farms here and everything is cool because we're renewable and their place has been polluted. Solar also, some solar is made with arsenic, some solar panels. So every form of energy has can be made in a very destructive way. And if we're going to use energy, we have to find the most benign sources and, and use them in the most environmentally safe ways. But there is no way of avoiding environmental impacts for any energy source. The uh, state of Hawaii, uh, uh, fake state as everyone knows, um, <laughs> There is a common law, and that common law is, in that common law, there is such a thing as Hawaiian usage in the Hawaii Revised Statutes. And that is Native Hawaiians have, um, have uh, rights to water. So when Henry said that there is steam, we, I learned this in 1974. 1974, a lot of the engineers and scientists uh, had a meeting here over at Turtle Bay, and that's how I got to know this particular thing. Simply said, steam is water and water is steam. So therefore, that's how the whole Native Hawaiian or Hawaiian uh, got involved into geothermal. I was sitting at the University of Hawaii before everyone decided to go over to Big Island and do that protest. I was there listening to all the the things that was coming about protesting against geothermal. Um, the other part simply said was that they were going to use the volcano as a means to dump all these toxicities 
into the volcano and it'll just burn, burn within the volcano, um, in, in the Pele. Uh, coal, uh, nowadays we're noticing that we're all, like Pele, incorporating and in, inducing into our bodies all the toxicity that's in the air. So those two simple things we were concerned with way back in the 70s when it came down to Girodomo. So when we got together, we just said, Aoli, you know, until you come back with a, to us with a better plan. So that's how the Native Hawaiian, uh, the Hawaiians got involved into Girodomo. It was steam is water and water is steam. They just didn't want to pay us for the usage of the steam. That's our water that they're using. Okay, so that was the, the crux of the problem as far as we participating in there. So, in answer to Mililani's uh, question. And I, I should point out one other thing about geothermal. Um, unlike California, California has the peak energy use when the sun is above us. We have our peak energy use after the sun is set. Therefore, there are three cheap ways of providing power in the evening when you need it. One is geothermal because you can always produce power that way. Second is ocean thermal, laying off the temperature differentials of the ocean. The third is to use the reservoirs that we have, the drinking well reservoirs and natural lakes that we have and to use solar and wind when it's available to pump water uphill and then to drop it in the evening. That's called pump storage hydro. And pump storage hydro is a major, accounts for 99% of all the energy storage on the mainland, and it's possible here. Wow. Question. I don't think we really need hydrogen, uh, we have all kinds of energy sources all around us, especially out of Hawaii. I'm working for a whole lot of solar right now. I know that uh, our project engineers, we decide, we figure out how many panels the roof needs, and it doesn't take the whole roof to see an automatic electric There's wind ideas that can be utilized on a roof of the house as well. There's all kinds of other energy uses without taking the chance at GSM. We just don't know about it. Uh, if we do you know, take the risk of you know, trying to utilize geothermal on a large basis, my opinion is um, we better off having it in the hands of the government. If it doesn't automatically have a profit going involved instead of being part of the enterprise. That's what I'm going to do. What, um, he's referring to about zeroing out your bill is if you put on enough solar panels on your roof so that you're supplying twice as much energy as you need during the peak of the day, you're selling your excess to the grid. Then in the evening you pull out from the grid when the sun isn't shining and on average you produce the same amount of energy as you needed and therefore your bill is zero. But for the grid, the problem is that if everybody is putting solar in during the day and pulling out at night, that energy has to come from somewhere at night. In the evening, where we have our maximum energy use, is typically in time without sun and without wind. So you need some other energy source for that evening period. And the, a solar panel has the maximum output around 10, 11 in the morning to about 3 in the afternoon. It begins dying down to the evening towards at night where it's producing nothing. So you need some source to make up for that. Uh, you want to hop the line? Hello. Uh, I have a few questions for you. One is, uh, I recently became aware of solar thermal energy for, um, uh, which uh, uses the heat of the sun instead of just the light to produce energy which if people don't know is being used, which is being experimented on in great success in the USA and the Mojave Desert. My question is, uh, what do you know about it and can it be used in here in Hawaii? And the other thing is, what do you have to say about the politics of moderation of energy use 
about using bicycles and not using electronics so much in the evening and grow, uh, doing urban gardening. Um, what, what do you have to say to people who, like here at Occupy, I notice a lot of people who feel connected to their computers and just can't get off of the laptops <laughs> and the cell phones. What do you, do you have yeah. any words of advice of how to use electricity wisely instead of just use, 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 and who cares where the energy comes from? Thank you. Good question. Your first question dealt with concentrated solar power. In its simplest form, you can take a parabolic mirror, and the sunlight is hitting it from many different directions, and you focus it on a pipe with molten salt in it. You can heat the pipe, and the molten salt will stay warm for a long time, and in the evening when the sun is set, it can produce electricity. That is one real possibility for the future. It works most ideally in the desert of the southwest, where the temperatures are much hotter and the molten salt can heat to 1,000 degrees Celsius. Here in Hawaii, does not work as well. There is a local company called Sofogy, S-O-P-O-G-Y, that is in investigating it at a local level. They have systems, very small, that can go on rooftops. Um, but the problem is that because we have lower temperatures, because we have more salt in the atmosphere, um, the cost of, of making thermal energy and using it in the nighttime is very expensive. It's being tested right now near the Keihole Airport on the Big Island, hmm. but it, it's not anywhere cost effective right now. The second question is, why can't we all conserve? We could, but the problem is that most people want somebody else to conserve. <laughs> and as an example, um, I've been to a number of renewable energy conferences, and I've said to renewable energy people throughout them, solar, wind, geothermal, everybody, we're all advocating change. We're about to have a coffee break. Let's come back and sit in a different seat. After 10 conferences, I've gotten one person to move one seat because everybody wants somebody else to change and someone else to conserve. So while it's good to conserve, I don't think it's going to be a... It can't be done by itself as the only solution. Um, it, it's, for example, how many of you go to the restroom at a, in, um, in your building, and the first thing you do is you throw on the switch? Now, most of you can figure out where the toilet is or where the urinal is, and you know where your equipment is. And sometimes there's light coming in the window, but the first reaction is always to throw the switch. So conservation is something that is great. It's a long-term strategy to get people to start being more aware of the world around them. But it's not going to be something that tomorrow we can get the world to change. The second problem with conservation is it's a lot easier to sell something to people if you say you can do what you are doing now and save money. It's a lot harder to say you have to cut back. Uh, somehow cutting back is not American, not Hawaiian. We tend to like to waste energy just as a as society. So yes, it's great in the long term. Yes, we need to figure out ways of encouraging it, but no, it won't solve our problems tomorrow. Okay, Henry, uh, what's the line? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I appreciate uh, the talk that you're giving, but you had mentioned several other forms to be able to get our energy from, and I was wondering what your thoughts on using thorium as an energy source rather than geothermal, solar, or wind. Yeah. Want to elaborate a little on uh, So thorium is it's a nuclear material that was discovered uh, around the same time as plutonium, but through political reasons. It was never really developed because you can't make a bomb out of thorium, but it's already it's already in its melted state, which makes it incredibly safe. It burns at like almost 90 percent, and then the uh, the leftover material doesn't have to be stored anywhere near as long as uranium. Um, it it really started to get gain traction with the uh, in the space program because it's it's naturally occurring. 
Um, and there's massive deposits of it on the moon, which would solve energy needs for something like like a moon base, where you wouldn't have to actually bring uh, a material in to create energy. But it's it's naturally occurring, and it's it's all over the United States. In fact, we have the second largest deposit of thorium in the world here in the United States. Um, there are two issues with nuclear, of, of any form of nuclear. One is that in 1978 we amended the state constitution to say that we will not use nuclear in the state. So it has a very, very high level of, uh, there is, you can get like a two-thirds vote in each chamber if you want to overturn that, but there have been nuclear bills introduced every year in the legislature. Panos is a major proponent of nuclear. Um, it has never passed out of a single committee of either the House or the Senate. One of the problems with nuclear is, in order to make it cost effective, you have to put in a large system. For example, if you are going to use uranium, the size of the plant to make it cost effective would be if you got all of the state's energy from one nuclear power plant. Hmm. All of the energy from one plant, so you need to put cables to all the islands, you'd be relying on one plant. The problem is a nuclear power plant has to be taken down one month a year for maintenance, and occasionally it crashes. So you have to maintain the entire renewable or entire energy system that we have now for that time when the nuclear plant is down for maintenance. So it presents an enormous, pro it presents a couple of enormous problems. All right, so my name is Adam, and uh, I just want to go over a couple of different uh, uh, energy sources that you were talking about. You have the solar, which is great, you know, green, or green, whatever. It only works 50% of the time, not very effective, right? So then you had your geothermal, which works off of the earth or whatever, you know, and the heat source and the steam. And other it's great, but it could be possibly detrimental. And nuclear is definitely detrimental, and science should not probably just try to stay out of it. Why don't we use something that works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and keeps you foot on this earth? There's some magnetism. I mean, a magnetic propulsion engine proposed by Nikolai Tesla before Thomas Edison in the Sphere campaign, but it's bought out its rights and put it to rest 110 years ago, could wipe out possibly the grid and keep it powered for free, forever. A magnetic propulsion engine would run forever and feed into the system. Two issues with that which are really interesting. First, Tesla is an interesting character if you go back and look at him. Because for some reason, Edison is the person we all remember. Edison did not have the first generator, although he's often credited with putting the first generator in New York City that led the United States to become having electric power. His first one was in New Jersey. New York City's was... Europe had electricity 25 years before the United States did. There's a lot of myths around Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla, the big three people who brought us energy. Edison is somehow very popular. He knew how to make himself popular. So he's the person we remember, and we named all our utilities, Con Edison, New York Edison, Southern California Edison, after him. He's the guy who came up with the electric chair. Um, he, he, he came up with a lot of ideas, some of them smart, some of them dumb, and we don't tend to remember Westinghouse and Tesla, who developed the transmission system that we have, alternating current, where we build power plants far, far away, and we have these massive transmission lines bringing them in. That is Westinghouse and Tesla. Now, Tesla also proposed all kinds of other things, and some of them dealt with magnetism. But if you look at his speeches and his writings, he was awfully very vague on what he was saying, and all sorts of things have been attributed to him. So magnetism might work, it might not work. There's a lot of speculation that it could work. But let's flip the coin around to the other side. How many people here really want free energy? There's a catch. We have cheap energy from 1750 to, to 2000, 250 years. We were able to find first coal, 
and then petroleum, and then natural gas, to find ways of having relatively cheap energy, and then to have petroleum and electricity which could move energy around to different places. And what did the relatively cheap energy do? It increased world population sevenfold. People no longer had to work in agriculture because there was mechanization. So they flooded to the cities. We began to have more and more cities and mega cities and more and more urban slums. Cheap energy has dramatically transformed the world. In 1900, 93% of the world population lived in towns of 5,000 or less. We were, people had agriculture, people were self-sufficient, there was a lot. In the last hundred years, we have made vast transformations. Cheap energy has enabled that to occur. If we had free energy for the next hundred years, we could increase the population of the world to 40 billion. We would put enormous stress on every sector of the rest of the world. So I'm not really in favor of cheap energy. Um, there are a lot of unintended consequences from that. Aloha. I was very interested in you and what you've been about, especially uh, towards your uh, and the people. And basically, the fear um, you're very educated and you have brilliant points of view but this part holds something special to me and I think it might also have a little bit of meaning to you that's kind of overlooked in this whole discussion of whose territory is this Ahoy Hoya is to represent something very special that's been kind of uh, buried. And I think you have some information about that. What it's about, but also about something that your group, our group, is going to be involved in that's very important. And as far as pushing an issue, this stands true to everybody here and what this park is about. Could you please share that? If you look, and I'm sorry, this might, the first sentence might sound boring, but it's very important. The state economy is about $70 billion. If you add up all the goods and services sold in the state in a year, it's about $70 billion. We import about $15 billion worth of goods and services, and we export about $3 billion. Now, that shows that we have about a gap of $12 billion a year, give or take. If, you're, if you were trying to build something sustainable and one-sixth of what you produced constantly flowed out of the state, how could you be sustainable? You couldn't. The way that Hawaii balances the books is they have a government that is not aimed for the people, but aimed at finding that $12 billion that we need to balance our books every year. And we balance it by bringing in military investment and tourists to give us their money so we can get that $12 billion so we can send it back out for the goods and services we buy each year. If we simply produce things within this state, if we became agriculturally self-sufficient and energy self-sufficient, we would more than half cut that deficit. We would be shrinking our deficit with the rest of the world, making ourselves more sufficient here, and we have to become self-sufficient here so that the government stops being focused on how to pull money in and focuses more on the education, the health care, and the quality of life here in Hawaii for the people of Hawaii. Hopefully, the nation, when it returns, will do that. But to do that, we need to grasp agriculture, we need to take energy, and we need to take a few other markets and start making things here. And so that is one 
really important reason for focusing on energy. It's the biggest slice of the de deficit. Thank you, Henry. Um, I want to thank you for uh, coming. And um, I want to know if burning trash is sustainable and what the hell is coming out of the end of those smokestacks. I've asked that question before, and people have led me on to uh, uh, other websites, um, but they don't actually talk about exactly what's going on here in Hawaii. So I thought you might know something about that. Thank you. I think his question was, if we all eat at McDonald's and we all <laughs> put our trash into a garbage to energy facility, can't we produce enough energy to power ourselves? Um, and, and what about the pollution? Um, frequently you hear people in the agriculture, agricultural energy industry say that um, agriculture, burning agriculture is just neutral because you're taking chemicals out of the ground, you're growing your plants, you're chopping them down, you're burning them, it's just a cycle. But the way we do the cycle here is we use a lot of pesticides, a lot of fertilizers all made out of fossil fuel, we use a lot of tractors powered by fossil fuel, we use expensive equipment to burn our crops. It's a, it's a very polluting approach. There is one company on Maui, Pacific Biodiesel, which first converted waste products at the central Maui landfill to make biodiesel and now works on very local crop production in communities to produce biodiesel within communities. So what I'm saying does not apply to them because I think they are truly a sustainable company, but it applies to 99% of the others. Burning agriculture is a very polluting industry that puts a lot of toxics into the air you're burning the pesticides and fertilizers that you used. You're putting a lot of dangerous chemicals into the air. Um, frequently during um, cane burning days, people came down with a lot of respiratory diseases. Yep. Yep. Burning any form, H power is bad. But we have a slight problem, and here's, here's the things that keep me up at night. If you landfill something, you create methane gas. If you burn it, you create certain pollutants. Methane gas does far more destruction for the climate. It's a far more destructive climate gas than burning it. So both are bad. Landfilling is bad, and burning it is bad. And you can't get around that. So. What you have to do is find ways of minimizing the waste, recycling as much of the waste as possible, and what you do burn has to be done using very careful filters, a lot of scrubbers, and a lot of monitoring by environmental groups to make sure the process is as clean as possible. <laughs> Thank you, Henry Curtis. Thank you, Henry. <laughs> Around. Yeah. Thank you. It was really an honor to have you here. Yep. I'm, I'm still reading your book. Anyway, um, so we're going to move on to our next speaker, who's waited really patient and great and wonderful and beautiful, Dr. Juanita Matthews. Can you please come to the stage? Thank you. Give her a hand for waiting so patiently. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about GMOs and exactly what type of genes are actually being uh, changed in the GMOs and why you need to be concerned not only about your health but also about the health of the environment around those areas. Um, I've just been reading a book that is absolutely wonderful. If you have a chance to read it, it's called The Omnivore's Dilemma. It's an excellent book. It talks about the history of food production in the United States and why we are in the situation that we are in. So one of the little backgrounds that uh, that book gave me that really gave me a little insight into why it is that we're using all of these GMOs and why it is that we're putting all these chemicals on everything and why it is that we're putting all of these artificial fertilizers on things and why it is that we have 
uh, huge concentrated feedlots where we have all of these cattle that are wallowing in their own filth and picking up all sorts of different diseases that are now antibiotic resistant. Why it is that we're putting pigs into little tiny containers where they can't even turn around for the rest of their lives. Why it is that we have chickens that are laying hens that have three birds per one cage and are, uh, they, they actually take off their beaks when they're young so that they can't peck one another. All of this comes down to one thing, and it's corn. That is the reason for all of this, is because of corn. I read this book, it's called Resources in Man. It was written in the 1960s, and it was talking about what were the main things that we needed to do when our population uh, started to grow. This was written way back when, when they, I think they only had four billion at that time. And they were saying that 10 billion people was the maximum. That was it. You couldn't get any more people. So they went ahead and they came up with a commission where they went and they talked to all of the political leaders of all the different countries and they said, hey, there's certain things that you guys need to do as countries in order for us to withstand these uh, population explosions. One of the big things that they said is you need to upscale your food production. Maximize it. Maximize it as much as you can because if we don't maximize food production, we're not going to be able to feed all these people. So what they decided to do is they decided to go to the one crop that you could get the most energy out of per square acre, and that was corn. Corn's amazing. Corn was the reason why the settlers here in the United States were actually able to survive. It was the one crop that could go ahead and convert solar energy into sugars. So... What we did is we decided to get really good at growing corn. And so we started to create different varieties of corn that we could go ahead and we could grow very close to one another. And those very close to one another corn varieties needed a lot of nitrogen in order to make them stand up straight and not fall over. So what we had to do is we had to come up with artificial sources of nitrogen. And those artificial sources of nitrogen came from a chemist who many people don't even know about, but he's the man that made this all possible. We wouldn't have the population that we have without this man. He figured out how to go ahead and fix nitrogen from the air using fossil fuels. So once he was able to do that, then he was able to create artificial nitrogen fertilizer. And the first place that they used that was in bombs, nitrates. And the other place that they used it when there, was no, when there was no war going on was putting it on our crops. And so these artificial nitrogen fertilizers, what they did is they allowed the farmer to go ahead and take all of the animals off of his land and just go ahead and grow corn. Well, when you take the animals off the land, you no longer have natural fertilizers or a natural nit nitrogen cycle. What you have now is a whole bunch of nitrogen being put on corn and running off into the streams. Once it runs off into the streams, it goes ahead and it causes algal blooms around the area, which then go ahead and decrease the oxygen in those areas, reducing your fish quality. The other thing that's happening is that nitrogen is not natural. It does not fit in the natural nitrogen cycle. So now we're increasing the amount of nitrogen in our Earth cycle by tremendous amounts, and we're doing it every year. So what we've done now is we've created two big problems. One big problem is when we grow corn, we have all this nitrogen that we're throwing on it, and now we have runoff. The other big problem is that we're taking the, the, the animals away from it, we're isolating them, and then now we have a whole bunch of animal waste, and there's nowhere to put it, so then it becomes a problem. So then that animal waste also becomes nitrogen runoff and starts going into the waterways. So you have a double whammy on both sides. And the reason for this, the entire reason why this entire thing has been messed up is because we are viewing agricultural practices in a factory industrial mode. And that is not how life works. Life works in a cyclical mode. It is not linear. And that is the biggest reason why all of these problems are happening. We're looking at our food production, how we look at car production, and that's just not how it works. So one of the biggest things that we need to do in order to overcome these problems 
is to go back to nature, to study how those cycles work, to look at people who have farms such as Polyface Farms. I don't know if you've heard about them, but if you watch Food, Inc., you probably know about them. Polyface Farms grows cattle, pigs, turkeys, chickens, all of that, and in huge quantities and very varied amounts. And you know what they farm there? They farm grass. Okay? The guy farms grass. He spends his entire time coming up with ways to farm his grass and have a nice variety of different grass. Because if you can farm grass, the cows go ahead and they graze the grass. You wait three days, the dung from the cows goes ahead and starts creating uh, maggots and things because of the flies. So then you go ahead and you take your chickens and you pass them over the areas that the cows have grazed on. They go ahead and dig into the cow poop because they want those grubs and they go ahead and they spread the manure just as better than any sort of machine could do it and they enjoy doing it and they're having a good time being what they are which is chickens and doing what they naturally do which is spread things around which is what most fowl do. So then after that you go ahead and you get the eggs which are wonderful because they're all full of omega-3s which you're getting from grass and not getting from seed right and so it's healthier and then you can go ahead and slaughter the chickens and you can slaughter the cows now the cow waste that's also interesting in a, in a barn setting the cow waste actually gets layered with uh, hay and a uh, few kernels of corn and they go ahead and they keep layering it they never muck out the barn and then at the end of it when the when the pile is about three foot tall take everything out and they put the pigs in and the pigs root around because they like the corn and the ethanol that it makes once it's fermented. So they go ahead and they root the stuff around and they start the composting process into kickstart. And then you have this beautiful, wonderful compost that you can go ahead and put back over your fields. That is the cycle. That is how life actually works. And it's amazing that we don't do more of that, especially here. And a lot of it is because people just aren't educated in how these systems work. They have come up to these same farms, they, you know, handed down through generations, doing the same sort of monocultures, put fertilizer on it, put chemicals on it, and they don't think that it's productive in another way. In this case, Polyface Farms doesn't have to import a whole bunch of chemicals and fertilizers. They don't have to get a whole bunch of antibiotics and things because the system takes care of itself. Right? But the only way that sort of system works is if you have local food distribution. Right? Because the USDA does not like small farms. And it doesn't mean that they, they're, they're, not, they're not after small farms. The problem is, is that their regulations are geared towards large factory farms. And those regulations, here's, here's one for instance. Every slaughterhouse has to have a bathroom that specifically assigned to the USDA inspector. That's his personal bathroom. Every slaughterhouse. So how, if you're doing a small-scale farming or small-scale slaughter, how are you going to have the money to go ahead and do that, just specifically for that, right? So there's all of these things. The, uh, there's a guy that was working with Polyface Farms that wanted to come up with a small-scale slaughterhouse operation so he could take Polyface's cows and slaughter them for him. And the problem that he had is the USDA inspector went in and he said, you know what, you don't have enough cows coming through here to justify me being here. And so they shut down the, the, the slaughterhouse. So that's what we're dealing with, is the regulations are geared towards large-scale farming practices and they're not, they, they, they don't work very well with the small farms. Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about is... Um, Basically, we were talking about BT toxin. Somebody was saying uh, BT toxin was safe. And yes, uh, if you look at it chemically, BT toxin, the way it works, it's a protein. And in an insect's stomach, an insect has an alkaline stomach. Uh, it goes ahead and it bores a hole into the lining of the gut, creates a leaky gut, and then the insect dies. Well, scientists said, well, hey, it's no problem with, the, with humans because humans have acidic stomachs. Right? So when the, when the protein enters us, it doesn't do the same thing, and it just gets broken down, right? Well, the problem is, is that the BT toxin itself is an allergen. It's recognized as an allergen in your body. So the larger quantities you get of it, the more of an allergic reaction you have to it. And this is very, very well shown 
in India where they're doing BT cotton. The problem is, is the BT toxin is in all parts of the plant. It's in the, the cotton part of the plant, the actual the fiber. And so when people go out and they pick it, or they work in the textile factories that are, are working with it, they get horrible skin rashes, and they get horrible lung diseases. And a lot of that is because of the allergic reaction to a foreign protein in such high quantities. It's not that it's working the same way that it does in an insect. It's that it's working as a foreign protein that the body doesn't recognize and looks at as an allergen. Okay, so it's eventually lowering your immune system. Right? Any sort of stress that's constantly, even if it's a low-level stress, is going to be lowering your immune system and making you more susceptible to chronic diseases such as cancer and other things. Right? So uh, the other thing is uh, Roundup Ready Corn. That's a big one. Uh, Roundup Ready Corn, what it is, is it's got this, uh, this uh, thing called glyphosate. That's the main ingredient in it, glyphosate. And it's an analog of an amino acid called glycine, right? It's a, it's a, it's a Frankenstein of glycine, okay? And so what it does is it goes in and it stops the plants from being able to uh, make some key things that allow them to survive. And so what they did is they genetically modified these plants to be able to go around that, that problem. Well, the problem is, is that glyphosate was touted by Monsanto as being safe. Well, now they're finding out that glyphosate in, in trials with mice, after three generations, the mice become sterile. They're finding that it causes kidney diseases. So they're, they're finding that glyphosate isn't as safe as they originally thought. And the other thing that they're finding is that the glyphosate isn't breaking down like they originally thought. They thought that it would never make it into the water table because it would be broken down too quickly. Well, now they've found it in five states. They've found it in five states in the United States that have uh, water tables that are contaminated with glyphosate. Uh, their surface water is now being contaminated with glyphosate. So the other thing that's happening is the entire tissue of the plant is being saturated with glyphosate because they can handle it, right? So you're getting high, high quantities of this glyphosate in your food, right? So that's the problem with Roundup Ready corn. The other thing is uh, Agent Orange corn. So Agent Orange corn, there were two different components. It's a one to one ratio of two different chemicals that were in Agent Orange. There is this 2,4-D and then there is 2,4-5-T, all right? So those were the two different chemicals. 2,4-5-T is the one that they banned because in the process of making it, you have to, you get contamination with dioxin, right? In the chemical process of making that chemical, you get dioxins in there. Well, the particular dioxin that it made, the, the US DARE, or the uh, EPA went ahead and said, all right, yeah, that, that stuff's really toxic. In fact, it was named the most harmful, deadly uh, chemical that man has ever created. That's what it was called because in very, very low levels, dioxin causes all sorts of horrible problems. In women, it causes endometriosis, causes cancer. So the, other, the problem with that is that the other chemical, 2,4-D, is made in a very similar way, and it also has dioxin contamination. But the particular type of dioxin that it is was not the one that the EPA banned. And that particular dioxin that it is has not been looked at by the EPA, but other independent uh, research labs have looked at it, and they've seen that it also causes cancer and also causes these toxicity problems. So they're already spraying T4D on cereal grains and some grasses. They're using it in lawns. So what we're saying is now they're going to be spraying even more of it, right, all over your corn and whatever else they can go ahead and make it resistant to. Okay, so uh, also T4D is uh, toxic to the liver, and I think, yeah, question? <laughs> In regards to the Roundup Ready, uh, can you explain why that wasn't, why weren't there, how were they, can you explain how they were genetically modifying isn't good for us, 
but I think you failed to mention that the, the reason for them genetically modifying it is so that they can use Roundup and, and these kinds of chemicals, you know, spraying them aerially, uh, synthetic fertilizers and, uh, and uh, bug control right. whatever. So, so yeah, the BT cotton, the way, or the BT plants, the way that they did it is they put the toxin in the plant. The way that they did it with Roundup Ready is they made it resistant to the chemical. So, so they can just keep spraying and they can keep saturating. The other problem with glyphosate that they, they weren't aware of is that glyphosate actually kills a lot of the microorganisms that are in the soil. So it totally disrupts the ecology of the soil. And just lately, there was a scientist that put out a warning out to the ag, to the USDA, and they basically told them, hey, we're going to have a huge, big problem on our hands because we've just discovered a new mycopathogen that is causing late-term abortions in, um, in, uh, in cattle and in, in uh, sheep. So it's really messing up farmers, farmer sheep, and they're, they're eating this corn and there, it's not it's not the glyphosate that's killing them or, or causing these problems. It's this pathogen that has now arisen because of the imbalance in the soil. So a lot of these problems, all of these problems that we're seeing with health, that we're seeing with environmental pollution, all of it stems from the, the, the same thing. It's the mentality that we can create linear systems on this planet. Because the reality is, is that we can't. And so when you try to create a linear system in an entire system that doesn't work that way, that works cyclically, then what you end up with is some sort of waste or toxic byproduct that does not get used and get, ends up polluting the area. So it's just like cancer. <laughs> it's an imbalance in the health. If you look at what happens in our health and how we're getting sick, and you look at how the cows are sick because they're, they're force-feeding cows corn. Cows don't eat corn. Cows eat grass. And in order to make cows eat corn, you have to get them antibiotics and all sorts of medications. And so you have all these poor, sick cows eating corn that they don't, they don't even enjoy, they don't like, and they're getting sick from it. And the other thing that's happening is it's changing the meat of the cow. It used to be that we could go ahead and eat beef, and that was no problem as long as it was grass-fed because the ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s in the meat was okay. But and I think it was 3 to 1 when, when, uh, when cows were, were grass-fed. So 3 omega-6s to 1 uh, omega-3. Now the ratio is 10 to 1. Okay, So that's because corn is a seed. And so the only type of oil that it has within it is omega-3s. Because seeds have omega-3s in them. Or omega-6s. Or omega so that, those omega-6s are now imbalanced in that meat. And that causes all sorts of problems with cholesterol and, and our, our obesity epidemic. The other thing that they're doing is they're taking that corn and they're, they're processing it and they're breaking it down to all its little parts and then they're putting it into all of our processed foods. Because they have all this corn, they've got to, they've got to do something with it. That's where high fructose corn syrup came from. And that's why we adopted high fructose corn syrup instead of sugar, because we had this huge surplus of corn that we had to do something with, because the government has been subsidizing it. The government is pushing for more corn. So, so the, best thing, the best thing that you can do is really to support your local farmers, to go out and look at what your local farmers are growing and how they're growing it, because organic farming, industrial organic farming, the type of organic farming that you're getting from Whole Foods, most of the time that's working on the same linear systems. So it's, it's, not, it's not sustainable. If it's organic, it's not sustainable. If it's being done in the same linear fashion, it's not sustainable. They're just buying organic corn and they're putting organic fertilizers on there. But again, they're not filling the loop, so you still have runoff. You know, so you still have all these problems. So it really comes down to finding someone that's growing food in a sustainable way, meaning that they're closing the loop.
Is there an is there a name for this uh, this, uh closed loop? Uh, like life cycle. So, so one of the things that um the big one of the big problems was that in the 1960s, 1970s, you had a whole group of farmers that went ahead and they said, hey, we don't like this industrial farming. We're going to go ahead and do organic farming, right? So they wanted to push for the label of organic. And the USDA fought them, fought them real hard, right? Because nobody wanted to, to, to say, oh, well, organic's better than, you know, how we're doing it now, right? But eventually, organic became something that they became interested in as a marketing ploy. So then you had all of these big companies go ahead and jump on the big organic bandwagon, and they went ahead and they started doing the same exact industrial farming, except now they're not using the GMO corn, or they're not using uh, anything that, you know, the the chemicals in it. But the problem is, (laughs) you still have the nitrogen runoff, you still have the, clo- the, the unclosed loop. You still have the linear system. So you have to be really careful when you're coming up with labels because if you come up with a label that the uh, industry can go ahead and spin in some way where they can take it over, right, without actually, uh, you know, following the, 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 the heart of what the label is supposed to be. <laughs> Fuck you. Bro, I have to remind somebody, bro, you have to know the history of this park. You have to, I asked Henry, I asked Henry to explain. Does anybody know this history of this park? Yes. We received our sovereignty in 1843. July 31st. You have to understand that. All this stuff that they're talking about doesn't belong here. That's right. So what the fuck are you getting all excited about? Everybody's missing the whole point. This, the whole point is we're illegally occupied. We're illegally ruled. Everybody else is trying to jump on it to our package that we've been carrying on from 118 years. You have to understand. We do understand, man. Right? Now let him let him Mahalo. give a, let him. I think the lady should have her floor back. No, I agree. Please. No, I agree. That's awesome. One thing that Juanita mentioned is supporting local agriculture. If anyone's interested in some information in regards to how to support local agriculture, come holler at me. Thanks, Lou. Thank you, Thank you Lucas. Can we give Juanita, wherever she is, a round of applause for being a champion just now? I just learned so much. That never happens. Um, <laughs> Um, can the, um, the speakers come take your place, wherever you are? Um, we have Mr. Henry Curtis, again. Ms. Hannah Mon- Miyamoto, thank you. And I'm not sure if... Juanita, you... Oh, you teach us. Oh, yeah, you teach. <laughs> The way of the animals and plants work together, traditional agriculture. Yeah, up here is still a petition. If anyone wants to come and take a look at the website and sign and be a part of of, of the change for the for the Vegas family with her um, battle with the Bishop Estate, please. Yeah, we need them. We got a seat here. Yeah, there's still free food, just so everyone knows. I'm going to go see if I can catch, uh, and I'm gonna actually oh no, this, uh, this oh. Like, um, this because this and is a uh, historic, uh, historic uh, part, 
really, he had a point of view that uh, said that. Oh, good. I want to. I want to get you to yeah, so to talk. It, it, there's because no annexation treaty. It's a fake state, and you know that's that. No, I think the line. yeah. I mean, it should get on the official uh, yeah, record of, yeah, of this. Yeah. 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 I know what you look for the official record. That's just that, that's, that's it. it. Yeah, and that's what no. this is about. And it should. And it should be. No, you. You know, you kind of wonder. Yeah, don't. You know, know. Okay, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll but, show the part. You wonder about how I feel about you guys. No, I right? know. Right. And, and, and about your occupied No, it's supposed to be solidarity, this, yeah. You know, the main thing of where it's being held at, yeah. the whole principle on that, this is, this is not really your program. Right, right. And yeah. You guys jumped on it. Yeah, I mean, and some of these people don't understand it. That are yeah, speaking. they don't understand They don't know. So. They don't know anything, and they're, they're coming here with that perspective. So they, they don't know that uh, it's... Uh, the, the significance, and they, they don't understand that it is it is the nation still continues, and then it, it's occupied land. Or even the history. Even, even the, the history. history. Well, yeah. They don't realize that. Don't so there's a lot of reiteration in yeah. education, so I, I know, you know where you're coming and from. And they should have had that point important. on the panel. If they I had, had my choice on the panel, I'd have Kyle Kajihiro, well, I'd, have, I'd, have, I'd have John that. Osorio. Yeah. The reason yeah. why I got mad is because I asked him to speak. Yeah, no, you've been waiting to hear it, and uh, uh, let's see if you can get you up there. Yeah. Uh, I think I somebody should. If it had, if it had that perspective on it, would, I mean, would, would it, would it feel uh, like? I mean, that recognition, that's what it is, right? Yeah, you should. The park, what it's about. You go, you Google this motherfucker, yeah. it's no, a fucking it's Hawaiian flag. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's the Hawaiian flag. Yeah. I know that. We, some of us know that. No, I, no, I know. Yeah. Yeah, I'll call Karen next year right now. I mean, I mean, anytime that that you're doing shows, you know, I always, I always. No, I knew, I knew the protocol was that. Huh? I mean, they didn't, they didn't ground, uh, ground it on Thomas Square. They should do that. But you know, everything is learning. You know, it's. But I learning. didn't know what this was, so I, uh -oh. I would have brought the flag. Would have brought. Yeah. You know, no, this but is we didn't. We didn't. I mean, I thought maybe John Osara would be here, and that the Hawaiian would be in there. So yeah. that's why I piped in when Henry was saying, because in 1974, all the engineers came to my shop. I had a right, shop at right. Sugar Mill. Uh, so they turned around, told me, "You Hawaiian, yeah?" I said, "Yeah, I'm Hawaiian." And they said, uh, okay, just remember, steam is water, and water is steam. Mm -hmm. That's all they yeah. simply said, yeah. steam is water, water is steam. So no one can go ahead un with geothermal right, right. until they sure. address the native Hawaiian issue, the Hawaiian issue. Yeah, yeah that's and what they I said. Should, and there should have been, like, at, at, at everything, there should be, like, a... Yeah. Kind of a little history lesson yes, about what yes, they're doing. Yes, yes. And part of the part of the evil of things like GMO and even yeah. the energy is yeah. that it's something that's you know imposed on something. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Not. So if they go ahead with you know, this, and then there's just nothing, no, you know, that that's grounding, when, when the rooting, that rooting into yeah. the root of you know, what this whole thing yeah. is. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. But yeah, this but is, it's just that we're all working thing. and working. Yeah, no, it's true. You know, everybody is, and, and, and yeah, everybody's kind of learning as they go along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not <laughs> something that we want separate <laughs> from, no, you know, no, the sovereignty you stuff or Kanaka Maui. That's why I don't And that's why, like, yeah, no, that's a good thing. Or Lapahoi Hoi is happening. Huh? Lapahoi? Lapahoi Hoi. Is that what it's called now? La ho i ho i e a. Oh, bro. Ho i ho i e a. I cannot say every year. Yeah, every year. Yeah, la ho i ho i e a. Yeah, it's coming up soon. July thirty first. July thirty first. Eighteen forty three. So it's always the last Sunday in July. Right. 
Yeah. And you know who they should have had here today? This doctor, what's his name? The one with the flag. With the what? The, the one with the flag, the, the Chinese doctor. What's his name? I know. In That's what I'm trying to say. I don't know his name. But I see him all the time. Uh, he's at these meetings all the time. Oh. He could have gone up and given up. Yeah. Thomas well, this square. You know, this is a. Yeah. But I don't think even, Dory even knew as about a, it. Yeah, even as a sustainability yeah. thing. He gives a, a talk about okay, this Thomas is Square. And he goes, puts the flag up. This is a, this is a thing about um, sustainability and food and energy. But at everything they do, they should probably have a... And that's the value, the value of you and, you know, Laoani. Yeah, that's why I'm coming in. Lao la Hoi, la Hoi, la Hoi, la Hoi, Ea. Yeah, the first meeting we had was actually called by Dr. Kikuni Blaisdell. First yeah. meeting we had, we had it's it right over there by yeah, the bathroom. They, they let's, always go, let's go there. mention that. Let's go uh, mention that on the panel. La Hoi, Hoi, Ea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go mention that. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait. Okay. Yeah, you can see. You want to practice it a couple of times. Yeah, practice it. Practice it. La, la, ho i And then A-I is in, you know. Sovereignty. It was actually Dr. Kikuni Blaisha told us to come and do it. Can you just mention that? No, I just... I can't just say this. It's embarrassing. The history, you know, the history of the thing, every time we do I think, I think from this what we'll learn. You know, we should invite him to come on over. What we'll do, what we'll... And what then we'll, a, we'll, just, we'll, we'll just splice it in. See, yeah. And then we'll put up the flag, we'll educate everybody. That's what I want to happen yeah. here. Is I always thought of waiting and then for... Everybody's thinking like it's those July guys. So that's July. why it's like people that love lines just come down and yeah. like, yeah. you know, talk to people. And then it's not going to be a separate thing. But yeah, I tell you, you need a lot of education. Yeah. You need a lot of education of people in Hawaii generally. Right, so, you know, right, this right. can be part of this. But yeah. Everybody's so kind of learning as, as the we The first one we had was right over there. It was yeah, I remember. Hibiscus hedges. Every year. So yeah. It's usually and in then, this corner. You know, we sat down. It was myself, Ava yeah. Mott, Gail Jean, and... Um, and some days it's really... Some some years it's really big. They got and, kind of, I and think Joe... Um, what's his name? Singer. I forgot his name. Joe... Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, we had it right so, there, yeah. and so we kind of like went yeah, around yeah. it. No, it's important. Yeah. And then yeah. everybody else took over, which was great. <laughs> okay. So we, we'll learn something or, or not, but, you know. Yeah. yeah. I just send, send guys, you know, I don't, want it, I don't want it to be a separate thing, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I know where people are coming from. Huh? Or independent. Yeah, that's, that's the, the thing. big. That's, that's the, the thing. That's the actual. Oh, yeah, day. Well, but this is the. They got fucking plaques from this. Yeah, there's a plaque right yeah, there. Yeah, right. duh. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, that is this important. This whole, whole thing. That's why right, somebody got to step up and you know it's, yeah. this is this style. It's step up in a yeah. microphone and nobody's yeah. running the yeah. thing. You know who's Basically, running it is the guy that. Steps They're up with the not, microphone. They should know that sustainability includes um, the, the, the law, international law, too. <laughs> and so no, we don't want to sustain everything that can be sustained. The first thing you got to ask the, the, is... The the is the yeah. No, I, I know. You know, we will we, we go fix, you know. No, but my whole evil, yeah. And then he'll learn, too. We'll, we'll get him books to read. No, no, listen. Google it, Google it. 1843, July 31st, the last... Back from Britain. They right. tried to take it away. The Paulette, we the guy's name is Paulette. We were power with France, Britain, and And then they went and had a big uh, party up the street, in Nuanua. So, anyway... I'm trying to figure out where they lined up. Was it on Punch Bowl or was it here? Did they lined up? I don't know, you got to tell me. So. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out where they lined up. But I'm glad you bust in. They, they, uh, they know there's, you know, some kind yeah. of something. They misunderstood. They gotta and she doesn't know that. She, she's a, and they're right. I don't know. I mean, that some of the people don't know. They don't know. Yeah. So it's good you brought them up.
We'll see what happens. No, no, I'll, Thank I'll, you, bro. Oh, can I give you the band? You want me to give you the hard band right now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're b- going back to the panel here. It's an interesting time out on the uh, on the history of this place and its importance, you know. And uh, this is how uh, things happen. This is how things grow and change. You've got to accommodate the truth. Always. So we're going to go back to the uh, panel discussion here and hear what people are talking about. Exactly what kind of the alienation. Um, but our transit service also, I think that's one reason why I put the talk about transit, I didn't really quite mention that. But I said that, you know, when you talk about the phrase road rage, you're talking about automobile drivers, right? You got people who they get into a little fender bender and they decide to go out and punch the person who they had a car accident with. Well, I don't, people are bumping into each other all the time on the city bus. And you don't see that kind of fighting. And I think the reason is, is because there's more connection when you're on the bus, you know? But the driving is just inherently an alienated experience. From And you're competing for a very precious resource. One, road space. Two, parking. And I think that's just a, it's a whole experience of driving is alienating. And of course, I just said, you know, we have overwhelming dependency on automobiles. So that's just one aspect of how I think what you mean by spirituality or spiritualness is that human connection, which is ultimately the basis of good Marxism, which is the good basis of good environmental protection, which is the good basis of good transportation planning and a lot of other, and community planning and all those things, I think. Is that, I think that's what, a, what I think that will respond to your question. Or your point. I, I, I do agree with you extremely much. When I do talk about spirituality, I'm not talking about religion teachers. They're part of it. <laughs> they're part. They're, yeah, they're one way we teach people to be yeah, But it's it connectedness. Yeah, I've been living in Hawaii for a long time. I've experienced how the, yeah, driving is a very good example, example of how it has changed, how people are becoming extremely aggressive yeah, when the way they drive. So we need to do the same thing with the mother planet, with the plants themselves. So if you want to succeed, you know, I mean, as scientists, we can, you know, address this virus, this that, and the same, same way as in modern medicine, but we're going the wrong way because we're losing the connection. And the only way we can keep that connection is right to do that. I want to do that. Does uh, anyone have the time? I should probably know the time. 8.46. It's okay. So you need to leave now. Oh, you're good. Okay. Um, anyone else? Um, if there is anyone else, I would like to ask another question. I will. Um, something before um, Pono, when Pono um, just has a beautiful theatrical exit, um, and um, something that Dr. Juanita Matthews uh, addressed is, is something about this mentality of where we're going right now and what our focuses are and our priorities lie. Um, this mentality of this uh, this agrochemical coal industrial <laughs> in Indo industry, right? So this whole mentality of us of, of us kind of going in this direction where we're worried about money and we're worrying about we're worrying about food and stuff like that. But really, the the don't we are are we aren't we forgetting something here? It, are we missing something here? Are we missing um, what what we actually want in in this life in this realm of things? The, this existence, right? Um, so I guess my my question is more so: How do we steer out of this? colonized mentality when we are in a colonized um, livelihood. Everything that we touch, everything that we live in, everything that we buy, if we, if we keep buying in, they'll keep selling the lie, right? So how can we steer and help people grow out of, um, systematically, gradually grow out of this mentality where we can finally do, um, think about each other and less about me, 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 right? Because most people, when they get mad and they get upset, if they forget about the other person. If I put my hand to your face like this, or to any of you, any of you like this, um, what do you see? You see the palm of my hand, and I still see just the back of it, right? But unless we can come to some mutual, you know, some mutual agreement, we'll never, you know, see the other side. And that's kind of like what I wanted to create here um, with all the all these speakers in this dialogue. So 
um, my question to you really <laughs> is um, how can we how we how can we um, start this ripple effect that 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 helps people open their mind up a little bit and kind of forget about me 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 and and remember where we come from and remember who we are and remember that we are all connected to each other and we can do it scientifically you know to each other biologically to the earth chemically and to the universe atomically can we remember how can we remember that in while we do have to worry about bills and stuff like that like how can we squeeze that into our lives living in this um, colonized system well, I think first we need to give a round of applause to Occupy. <laughs> Occupy has really sparked the imagination. And when the majority of the country is sympathetic to what Occupy is saying, that really says something about resistance to the way we're heading. I, I think um, there I think the opposition, if you will have it, the, the people who are out for themselves, out to maximize money and they don't care about the planet around them, or a small group who are seeking to seize power, and this is our opportunity to take back this country. This brings up what we talked about. Dory and I had talked about this beforehand. What am I doing in the future? And I and we're really encouraged by the the, the turnout we've had, and it's a very short amount of notice. Is um, uh, is is it's actually? So I don't want to use the word school, but we need more opportunities because we know that a lot of people don't go to college, or if they go to college, they don't focus on social issues. And. Um, you know, for instance, per my personally, that was kind of what I was doing when I was 19 years old as I was going to meetings and, and learning and stuff like that. So I've been doing this for like 30 years. But I think that is, is what we really need to do. That was actually one of the strong points of the old left. Whether you're talking about the Socialist Party or the Communist Party in the United States, was they educated their members. And they had free programs, free schools, free forums. There are even existing institutions today, like the New School in New York City, which still exists, which actually began with the Communist Party. So I just think that, uh, not that I'm, I'm going to say praise that well, we need to follow the socials of the communists, but we need to realize that we educate ourselves, and and uh, and then, you know, uh, and ultimately uh, develop a count what we call it, technically call it a counter narrative. A narrative is what explains something like unemployment, or or, or you know, or um, uh, or, or, or high taxes, um, or to, but uh, a counter narrative is a different narrative that conflicts that existing narrative. And I think when we uh, develop it, and that's why I want to reach out to the young people here too, people who are under 30, let's say. Um, when you, if you were to get out there and basically say, I'm against, uh, I'm, 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 I'm questioning capitalism, I'm against the, the massacre of our planet, and, uh, and I know why it's happening, and I know how they're all connected. I do feel that that may be the hard problem, because we need to have the whole picture, or it just becomes very superficial. It becomes like I was saying earlier about, you know, yeah, I recycle my, my plastic, I separate my garbage, leave me alone. And that's just not enough. So I think we need that, but, but if you're young, you know, young people were to, were to stand up and create your own culture, your own values, your own beliefs, your own principles, and your own media, using the existing social media that's out there, which is there really to sell you more products, by the way, I think that you know, there, would be a, there would really be a chance for a serious change in this time, in this time because that's ultimately what it is. Politics is determined by people's values. And we have to, we cannot ignore it. People have talked about, you're a scientist, you've got all these numbers and facts and theories and data. Yeah, but ultimately I've got values. And you know where my values personally came from? The gall darn Franciscan Catholic Church. That's where it came from. Okay, I am the same person when I was, that I was when I was five years old, in, in my own heart. Now that's me. So I just think that, and then, you know, so other people have... So I want to thank two other groups also. Besides Occupy, very, very important. Olelo, very important. And Youth Speak, Slam Poetry, very important.
All right. Quick shout out to Adbusters too. Be sure Adbusters.com. Check out their material. That's really where you can see a, 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 they they've got. They, if you actually read through their website, you'll see they've got theory behind their practice, and their practice is brilliant. All right. So I just got a question based on uh, full sustainability of all the stuff we've already gotten out of the earth, all the resources that we've already turned into tin cans and then threw in a landfill. You know, how much of this stuff is recoverable? Because I, I don't remember who said it, but somebody said something about burning it or, you know, a landfill, like comparing those two. Is there, is there any way we could do something more, you know, efficient with this? And, and already the stuff that's there. Because I feel like we could do a whole lot more, more with our resources than we are right now. Well, one thing, I don't even realize how much solid waste is produced by packaging. And we're slowly getting over that. But still, when you go to stores, you tend to see a lot of so-called blister packs or even all plastic packaging. And uh, so a lot of that's even not even recyclable plastic because, uh, recyclable pl because we can't recycle number seven. And number seven is the mixed plastic. So in other words, if it's cheap enough to put on the outside of a package. Anyways, I'm just kind of tell you that uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, can I say, we, 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 we reuse our resources. But I think it's also important to remember the economics of the whole process. The reason why we have so much waste production is because it's cheap. And whether, now one way to solve that problem or deal with that problem is by avoiding what we call externality. So, uh, you know, like for instance, you know, like, can, can, uh, an analogy would be like the carbon tax. The idea being that if you're going to emit carbon dioxide, you need to pay for the full uh, cost of that. Uh, therefore, you may, you'll be encouraged not to produce carbon dioxide. So that's, that's an example of what we need to do with waste. We sort of do that with uh, recyclable bottles. And that's really what they're doing. What they're doing there, we put, a, we put a price on it and we give you an incentive to go return it. As you well know, just on there, you know, I put plastic bottles in that trash and I'm sure they're not going to be there in the morning. I, um, the group that I run, Life of the Land, sued the Navy in 1971 for bombing Kaholave and requesting that the military do an environmental impact statement. And we got the first military environmental impact statement in the country. Um, the military answered us by saying that bombing is actually good for the environment. Because first it creates craters that can hold water. And second, it deposits trace minerals that one day you can mine. <laughs> oh gosh. So um, there, there are those crackpots that will always say, we could, um, we can recover all this stuff that we've done. It's really hard. We've made a mess. But what we need to do, a life cycle analysis we're just starting to do, where you look at something from cradle to grave. And we need to take it the next step, what's called cradle to cradle, where you look at any waste product you produce, you could, should find a use for it for something else, so you're not producing any final waste. So you need to design systems such that they are just continuous and you're not needing to find somewhere to dump your waste products. And, and hopefully that will take root more. Uh, I'm also reminded, um, um, Ray Anderson came out to the Grand Wailea in um, 1997. He was a person who ran a carpet company called Interface. And he read a book called The Ecology of Commerce, which talked about how you can cut down on toxic um, emissions. His company, uh, he made carpets. You basically, you lease a carpet from him, he comes in and replaces it, he puts in new sections. And um, he found ways of reducing toxic emissions in the carpet industry by 70% while saving money. Um, so it's, it's finding um, ways of using less toxic materials in the first place so you don't have to find ways of disposing of the waste afterwards. Cool. I want to throw a quick shout out here. I, my understanding is aluminum cans are one of the things that are most recycled. Uh, if there's some ridiculous percentage of that's recycled, it's far higher than paper and definitely plastic. But the trouble with aluminum cans are, um, while collecting them and it saves the aluminum ore, that's the reason why. Aluminum ore is very expensive, 
so it's cheaper to take up those cans and, and remelt them down. But you melt them down with a lot of energy. Yeah. So now what do you do? You see, um, and then of course there's the sheer cost. And we all know on the island, everything is tips, tipsy turvy because of shipping costs. So aluminum cans are extremely expensive. Plastic bottles are much cheaper. Um, but it really comes out. It, it, it really shows you that um, I, I've, I've known this for 22 uh, years. Is, is that environmental coming up in the protection is only an park economic park issue, and, and a lot of damage occurs because of uh, like cut twisted back, or cutting uh, economic out system. No, uh, thanks. So